Tonight, Associate Professor Matheson Russell from the Faculty of Arts will share how democracy is being reimagined and how these notions could be used to imagine a citizen-led political institution. Our MC is one of Matheson's research students, Balamahan Shingade, whose research looks at epistemic injustice in the context of settler colonialism. Balamahan will introduce Matheson more fully in a moment, and later he'll talk to him about his research before asking the questions you, the audience, have for him. I'll now hand you over to Balamahan, our very capable MC. Enjoy the talk. Kia ora, Fiona. Enga mana, enga reo, enga hauefa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. My warmest Pacific greetings and welcome to you all this evening's Raising the Bar event with Associate Professor Matheson Russell. My name is Balmohan Shingade and I'll be your MC for this evening's talk with Matheson on democracy, but not as we know it. Around the world, it, it appears to be a crisis of democracy. There's the rise of authoritarianism, threats of corporate capital, circulation of disinformation and misinformation, and really an overall increase of political polarization. So it seems that democracy is under pressure and that faith in it is declining. So what can we do? What kind of a future for democracy is possible? Now, it's my real pleasure to introduce Dr. Matheson Russell, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Auckland, where he teaches courses on justice, power, and democracy. He has expertise in 20th century European philosophy too, and has published books on the work of Husserl and Habermas. His current work as a social and political philosopher focuses on theories of democracy. His work encourages us and prepares us to rethink our received models of democracy. Matheson's talk, will explore democratic innovations currently occurring around the world, models of uh, citizen-led policymaking that are reimagining the institutions of democracy for the 21st century. I can't wait to learn how these nascent forms of democracy are evolving alongside periodic elections um, and how they may come to inform new ways that decisions can be made. Now, before we get into it, I'd like to bring your attention, dear listeners, to uh, the Q&A function on your screens. At any point during the talk, I encourage you to submit questions for Matheson using the chat box. You can also upvote questions that come up and these will move to the top of the queue. I'll be keeping an eye on the questions and I'll pose some of these with the highest votes to Matheson towards the end of the talk. So without any further ado, I'd love to invite Matheson to speak with us. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Bella Mohan. Uh, so, uh, ko Matheson Russell, toko ingwa, um, tēnā koto katoa. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, and the topic that we're going to be discussing is um, the future of democracy. As Bella Mohan said, uh, we're in a period of time when democracy is under strain. We are uh, experiencing a sense of pressure um, as democratic countries. 30 years ago, 35 years ago, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, we were told that this signaled the end of history, that uh, the Cold War, War was over, the communist cause had been defeated, liberal democracy had won the day. And yet, uh, as Bella Mohan alluded, we are currently experiencing environmental crises, persistent economic inequality, uh, ascendant authoritarianism, corporate capture of political decision making, voter turnout is declining, trust in democracy is declining around the world. So is there a future for democracy in the 21st century? Is the model of democratic politics that we've inherited up to the challenge? Now, what hasn't been widely reported, despite the overarching trend of democratic decline, is that there has been a wave of democratic innovation and experimentation around the world. Since the turn of the 20th century, 21st century, we've seen experimentation with new democratic processes and institutional forms in lots of countries, 
Australia, Belgium, Brazil, England, France, Iceland, Mongolia, Scotland, and Taiwan, just to name a few. Under our noses, democracy is being reimagined and redesigned around the edges of existing democratic institutions. And I want to spend a little bit of time tonight telling you about a few of these developments. I won't have time to talk about how hundreds of cities have adopted a practice called participatory budgeting that empowers local citizens to decide for themselves what public projects and initiatives they want their city councils to fund. And I won't have time to describe how some cleverly designed online platforms have been used in places like Finland and Taiwan to enable community stakeholders to generate policy solutions to tricky social problems. But what I will be focusing on tonight are some examples of citizen-led decision-making processes that make use of an ancient practice called sortition. Now, sortition just means random selection. Sortition or lottery was a, a central feature of ancient Athenian democracy. In Athens, as you will know, all citizens had the right and the ability to participate in the assembly, in the business of politics. Um, in particular, the ecclesia, the general assembly was a place where uh, any citizen could speak. But the ecclesia was not a lawmaking body. The role of the ecclesia was limited to discussions of certain predetermined issues. Most of the business of political decision-making took place in other bodies including the boule, the 500 member council, which set the agenda for the assembly meetings, the nomothetai, the lawmakers, and the dicasteria, the courts, each of which involved hundreds of citizens. But the citizens were not elected to these bodies. Each year, a panel of about 6,000 citizens was randomly selected. And from that panel, were chosen by lot citizens to sit on each of these bodies for a term. In this way, the lottery system meant that citizens would rotate through political offices over the course of their lives. Renaissance Italian cities like Florence also used lotteries in some parts of their political systems, making random appointments to lawmaking bodies, for instance. And lotteries were thought to be a really important tool to try and break down the possibility of concentrated power in the hands of particular families. Now, until recently, sortition has been little used in modern democracies, uh, apart from in selecting citizens to sit on juries in court. But it's making a remarkable comeback. Let me give you a, a couple of examples. So in 2016, the Irish government commissioned 99 ordinary citizens who were randomly selected uh, and a broadly representative of the Irish population to consider the contentious issue of abortion law reform. Over a series of weekends across several months, this citizens assembly interviewed experts, heard firsthand testimony, weighed medical, moral and legal arguments. They deliberated together and finally they drafted a set of recommendations. The politicians, the elected politicians who observed the process were, were impressed by the rigor of the process and the quality of the recommendations that the, the Citizens Assembly produced. And the Irish public were able to observe people like themselves conscientiously working through a matter of complexity and moral gravity. Ultimately, the work of that Citizens Assembly was instrumental in moving Ireland forward on a politically deadlocked issue and abortion laws were successfully liberalized through a referendum and a constitutional amendment in 2018. Now, over the past decade, the use of so-called mini publics like the Irish Citizens Assembly have prol proliferated. Citizens Assemblies and other smaller so-called mini publics have been convened to address a wide range of issues from urban planning to transport, uh, tra traffic issues and transport issues, to electoral reform, climate change. And as we speak, there is a citizens assembly meeting in Dublin discussing the uh, problem of biodiversity loss. Uh, 
But there are other sortition based experiments that have occurred. And I just want to mention two more examples before I move on. The first one is something called a citizens initiative review. So in some jurisdictions, uh, like the US state of Oregon, citizens are regularly asked to vote on citizen initiated referendums. These are called citizens initiatives, citizen initiatives. However, voters are faced with a knowledge gap. They don't often know much about the initiative that they're being asked to vote on and they have trouble forming um, a judgment about whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. So organizers in Oregon invented the citizen initiative review. And the idea here is that, as a, again, a randomly selected group of citizens, in this case, 18 to 24 citizens usually, who are um, demographically representative, come together for a few days, five to three to five days usually, to consider the ballot initiative in depth. They interview proponents and opponents of the initiative. And what they produce at the end is a single sheet of paper, which gets enclosed with the voting ballots that go out to all the voters. And the sheet that they produce called a citizen statement attempts to summarize what that initiative is about, the key arguments for it and the key arguments against it. And it also reports how the participants in the review process intend to vote, having considered the issue in depth. And this particular innovation has been uh, made a permanent part of the way the citizen initiatives are run in Oregon since 2011. Uh, the second example that I wanted to add here is um, the, an even more ambitious experiment in participatory democracy. Um, Iceland, as you might recall, was thrown into chaos uh, following the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And following public pressure, the parliament agreed to um, agree that the constitution of Ireland should be completely rewritten. Now, a coalition of um, activists and scholars and community leaders designed a process which was um, quite independent of parliament at that point. Uh, in 2009, they drew together a randomly selected group of 1,500 citizens to um, effectively brainstorm what they thought a constitution, a modern constitution should look like. They used um, not just that, uh, the group of people who were brought together, but also crowdsourcing techniques, um, online platforms to bring the broader public into that process as well. The following year, uh, another randomly selected forum was brought together, this time of 950 citizens. Uh, and this time it had the backing of, of the parliament as well. And after that process, um, the citizens of Iceland elected 25 people independently of parliament to draft the constitution based on the ideas that they had um, brought together. And the, resu the resulting draft constitution then was the result of an extraordinary effort, a participatory effort um, by Icelandic citizens. Um, and it touted some quite radical ideas, including the right to internet access, the idea that um, there should be nationalization of previously unowned natural resources, uh, and the right of citizens to initiate a referendum on an existing law. Um, and so uh, cases like this, the, the um, Oregon Citizens Initiative Review, the, um, the Irish Citizens Assembly, and this Icelandic constitutional redrafting project, I think really show how narrow our imagination of democracy can be. Um, it has inspired um, uh, political scientists and political theorists to think again about what democracy should look like and whether the existing models of democracy are really fit for purpose. Uh, Yale political scientist, Hélène Landmore, for instance, who was an in-person observer of the Icelandic constitutional drafting project, writes in her recent book, Open Democracy, that the Icelandic example emboldened me to conclude that the limits of our current systems, as well as the changes brought about by globalization and the digital revolution, call for a radically different approach to the question of the best regime, one that interrogates the very institutional principles of democracy as we practice it today. So let's reflect upon these examples um, a little bit and, and we need to think about them um, critically. What do we learn 
from these experiments in citizen-led policy development. The first thing which is uh, really strong is that ordinary people are perfectly competent to make complex decisions if they're given the opportunity, the context and the resources to do it. There's now quite a large body of empirical evidence that shows when participants are presented with information, uh, with arguments on all sides, and they have the opportunity in particular to discuss this with one another, they're perfectly capable of making um, com competent decisions on very complex issues. And in fact, there's been some scholarly analysis of the arguments made in some of these um, mini publics. And they've shown that they're often more, more in depth, more technically competent and more nuanced than arguments that you typically find in parliaments or even parliamentary committees. Uh, people are able to uh, judge trade-offs and deal with trade-offs, weighing up competing goals. And interestingly, on some issues where there is in the population quite um, polarized views, in the context of deliberation, you find actually quite strong bipartisan consensus. Um, and the longer that people have a chance to, to think about them together and to learn about them together, the stronger those um, consensuses can become the more convergence you get uh, among the participants. Not always, but in some cases. Uh, and, and another observation that is made by um, the scholars of, this, um, of these experiments is that often the values of participants overlap more than you might think as well. So that's the first thing that we learn from these experiments, that citizens are really competent. Ordinary citizens like you and I are perfectly competent to make complex political decisions. The second observation that um, I'd make is that sortition, this process of, of uh, random selection, can be used to create a really clever division of democratic labor. Sortition means that only a few citizens are able to be involved in a given decision-making process, and that has some downsides, but that exclusivity also has some upsides. So when we use sortition to delegate democratic decisions to a subcommittee of the whole, as it were, 20 to 100 people, what that means is that rather than many of us engaging in a shallow way in a political decision, a few of us can engage in it in depth and in a much more effective way. At the same time, because there are only a small number of participants in the decision-making making process, the participants know that their, um, their work is consequential. And that promotes a sense of responsibility and conscientiousness when it comes to the hard work of considering evidence and weighing up practical decisions. Um, furthermore, a carefully managed process of sortition can ensure that a diverse and representative group of citizens is included in the decision-making. Uh, now, let me pause for a moment to explain to you how the, the sortition process will typically work in a, in a modern process, in a modern uh, mini public. So what will happen is a large number of invitations will be sent out to a random sample of citizens, inviting them to participate in the mini public. From those invitations, only a subset will respond, saying that, yes, they're willing to participate. And from that set, an algorithm is used to randomly select a group of individuals who meet certain criteria for demographic representativeness. So you might need, um, you might want to ensure that you have a balance of genders, a spread of education levels, spread of ages, um, ethnicity, geographical locations, and so forth. Uh, and so the participants come together and what the participants in these mini publics themselves report is that in the context of a well-organized assembly or citizens jury, they find that it's possible to have respectful and productive dialogue with fellow citizens um, who hold very different views from their own. Taking political dialogue out of a hyper-partisan context turns out, not surprisingly, to be conducive to more collaborative and reasoned decision-making. And finally, random selection insulates political decision-making from being corrupted by the influence of money or other threats and inducements that are sometimes faced by elected officials. Participants are free of concerns about re-election 
Uh, and in fact, some observers see the anti-corruption potential of sortition as its key strength. And I'll come back to say a little bit more about that later. Okay, so um, there are some uh, surprisingly positive and exciting aspects to uh, the use of sortition in its modern form. Can these kinds of innovations be scaled up? Can these concepts of sortition, rotation, deliberation be used to imagine a genuinely citizen-led system of political institutions in a complex modern society such as our own? Um, and not surprisingly, democratic theorists have been following these real world developments with great interest. And it sparked new conversations about what our democratic institutions could look like in the future. So uh, in the last few minutes that I have with you, what I wanna do is to just give you an overview of four different ways that sortition might be used to reshape and strengthen the way our democracies function. Um, and I'm going to give some comments along the way of the pros and cons of these particular um, um, ideas and potential uses. Okay, so the first one is what we might call sortition for policy development. And this is the role that sortition bodies, many publics have mostly been used um, to play up to this point, to carefully develop policy recommendations on specific policy questions. And I think for certain policy questions, sortition based citizen led processes could be just the right thing. They seem to be particularly apt for issues where there is, for instance, political stalemate, or where parliamentarians have conflicts of interest, for instance, in setting salaries and rules of conduct for parliament, uh, where political incentives can be misaligned with prudent policy, which often happens uh, when elected officials need to address long term problems that impose costs now. And an obvious example of that would be climate mitigation and adaptation. And also where political decision-making is unduly influenced by powerful actors um, who know how to steer government decision-making to serve their private interests. Um, an example in our context, this might be sadly housing policy. So, so there are particular policy areas, I think, where, where um, many publics have, have um, may, may be just the right kind of tool for us to be using uh, in our democratic system. There may be potential also to give citizen bodies an even greater role in high level policy setting or policy direction, which is a task usually left to the fortunes of, elect, of elections and to see who, which parties get into power. Um, and they then set an agenda for, um, for the way that policy goes. So for instance, a citizen-led led process could be used to set high level strategic policy with regards to immigration or taxation or mental health. Although for complex and far reaching issues like tax reform, something more than a citizen's assembly is likely to be required. So we'd probably want to adopt something um, more like the Icelandic constitutional process, or perhaps like the new itinerant citizens assembly of Bogota, which makes use of a sequence of citizens assemblies to build on each other, tackling issues in a staged fashion from problem definition to uh, information gathering to um, canvassing solutions. But many publics are also uh, have some downsides. Um, they're costly. They're costly in terms of money, but also in terms of the time required from citizens. And so the benefits in terms of quality and robustness of decision-making needs to be worth the cost. Uh, and, and it could be that on, on some issues, perhaps many issues, existing um, political processes are, are perfectly sound. There's also an interesting question um, about how much uh, decision-making power these bodies should have. Typically they're empowered only to make recommendations and often that seems appropriate, but it, it also means that recommendations can be pushed aside by elected governments if they're politically inconvenient. And this is exactly what happened to many of the recommendations that came out of the 2019 Citizens Convention on Climate Change in France. Another consideration here is that every policy problem is different. Uh, it involves different groups of stakeholders, 
different information gathering challenges, different justice considerations. The citizen-led decision-making processes can't easily be replicated from elsewhere. They need to be tailor-made uh, to suit each issue. And that will be especially true here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where obligations under Tatariti will necessarily be a central consideration. Okay, so that's sortition for policy development. That's the first way in which sortition could be used. I think there's some potential there. The second way um, that sortition could be used to um, reshape our democratic system is sortition for lawmaking, if you like, legislature, legislature by lot. Um, and there are some scholars who've who are very enthusiastic about sortition and who have made proposals along these lines. We should be abolishing our parliaments of elected representatives and replacing them with um, randomly selected citizens. Or perhaps slightly more modestly, we should be adding a sortition chamber to our parliamentary system, um, like an upper house. Or a third alternative here, to, um, to mix elected representatives within one chamber with uh, randomly selected citizens. Now, the arguments for this kind of um, uh, revolution in the way that parliament, parliamentary membership is allocated are that, well, random selection is going to give us a more diverse set of legislators uh, who are more authentically representative of the population. And I think that would certainly be true. Secondly, that it would overcome the problem that professional politicians sometimes face perverse incentives arising from their interest in re-election. But I think there are some significant um, practical concerns about this kind of proposal. Firstly, requiring citizens to participate in a legislative body for an extended period of time, 12 months or more, is a big ask in terms of time and commitment the practical barriers will probably be, make it impossible for a large majority of citizens even to consider volunteering if they are invited to take up such a role. Secondly, the, the work of a modern legislature is complex and technically demanding. Uh, and there's a danger that uninitiated citizens will struggle to develop an independent view on the merits of particular legislative proposals and would therefore be vulnerable to the influence of uh, officials or professional political actors. And thirdly, to the extent that the um, randomly selected citizens do become competent and savvy in the game of political negotiation and horse trading, they risk becoming just like the professional politicians that they're supposed to contrast with. Uh, so for my part, I'm, I'm a little less um, sanguine about the the, uh, those kinds of proposals. Uh, the third uh, way in which sortition could be used is uh, what we might call sortition for democratic oversight. So recently, in fact, in an article that came out just a couple of months ago, uh, political theorist Sam Bagg has suggested that perhaps the greatest potential for sortition-based mechanisms lies in their use as a tool for preventing corruption in political decision-making. Here, the idea is that randomly selected citizens could be called together to exercise independent oversight over governmental decisions uh, so that they can verify that decisions have been made in the appropriate way. So, for example, a sortition based citizen panel could review decisions to award major public contracts, they could scrutinize changes to election laws. Uh, they might have, uh, they could sign, have to sign off on um, uh, those kinds of changes. They could scrutinize interactions between lobbyists and elected officials. They could provide democratic oversight and accountability for public institutions that um, in our existing political systems are meant to operate at arm's length from government, such as police departments or the Reserve Bank. Uh, and the interesting thing with these kinds of proposals is that in contrast to the complexity of the work of a legislature, the oversight role is slightly more tractable for citizens with no background um, knowledge of the issues. It requires assessing governmental decisions by a set of prescribed criteria 
uh, and the time required for citizens to participate in an overview, an oversight process like this would be comparable to that of serving on a jury in a court case. But there could be significant advantages in terms of achieving effective democratic accountability through these kinds of mechanisms. By involving randomly selected citizens, the oversight process is far less susceptible to uh, corruption or capture by wealthy and powerful individuals and groups. And we can trust that fellow citizens will make judgments and evaluate government decisions using the same kinds of um, community expectations and values that, that we hold. So that's the third way that sortition could be used um, to, to reshape and upgrade our political systems, sortition for um, democratic oversight. The fourth and final one, which I'll mention, um, is one that I can illustrate with a very current real world example. So um, we'll call this sortition for dialogue with elected officials, sortition for dialogue. So in 2019, on the recommendation of a citizens assembly, interestingly, the city of Paris adopted a bill requiring the establishment of a permanent citizens assembly. And last year, 2021, the model for the permanent citizens assembly was devised and passed into law. Uh, so the mandate for this permanent citizens assembly is to provide a voice for the people into a uh, dialogue with the decision-making of the city. So we have um, 100 citizens selected for a one-year term and the assembly that they belong to will meet only sporadically and it will be empowered to propose bills to the city council that will have to be debated. It's empowered to review decisions by the council. It can commission a citizen's jury or citizen's assembly on a particular topic each year. Uh, it also sets the topic for the annual participatory budgeting process, which I mentioned earlier. And it serves as a point of contact for citizens and community groups who want to interact with or provide information or advice or feedback to the city council. Um, and I believe that the first cohort of randomly selected citizens have accepted their invitations and the first meeting of the City of Paris Permanent Citizens Assembly will be taking place soon. So the concept here is that the citizen, the citizen body, the, the sortition body sits alongside the city council as a kind of counterpart. Uh, it's not subordinate to the power of the city council and it's not a superior power to the city council, um, but it provides information and flow of ideas and feedback and review, as well as being able to initiate um, uh, uh, proposed bills to the city council. Um, and I think this is a particularly powerful model for strengthening decision-making and accountability of city councils, uh, or in fact, any um, elected body, provided that there are binding mutual obligations on the council and the citizens body um, to work together. Okay, so those are the four ways in which sortition could be used um, to reshape our democratic institutions. Obviously it's not been my intention tonight to provide a definitive answer to the question of what our democracy should look like in the future. But what I've tried to do is to say just enough perhaps to show you that the democracy of tomorrow could look plausibly quite different to the model of democracy that we've inherited. And the challenge for us as citizens is to employ our intelligence, creativity, and our advocacy to ensure that the democracy of tomorrow is the kind of democracy that we need it to be, fair, inclusive, citizen-led, forward-thinking, and properly equipped to tackle the challenges that we face. Kiora. Naomi Hinui Kiakwe Matheson, thank you so much for your talk. You know, uh, your talk leaves me with a sense of excitement because it's as if we're on the cusp of some real innovation. That's the uh, generosity that I see in what you've offered today. And thank you, uh, listeners, for your really challenging and interesting questions, which I can't wait to get some insight from Matheson on. And um, uh, I'd like to encourage, you know, further questions. Um, if you've 
not had the chance to type them into the chat box, then um, yeah, please leave them here. There are such good questions ranging from the more technical and requests for clarifications to the more sort of aspirational and um, uh, forward looking. So um, let, let's dig right in and I'll select from the questions that have been sort of upvoted. Um, so to begin with, uh, this seems like a question with a request for clarification. So the question is, is a high level of education or literacy a prerequisite for such lottery-based groups to be effective? For such lottery-based groups to be effective? Yes. Uh, no, no, it's not. Um, and uh, uh, one of the um, findings of the scholars who've been looking closely uh, at, at these kinds of events is that um, it's hugely valuable to have people from all walks of life in these forums. Uh, and that uh, you know, if they're properly, are properly moderated and facilitated, um, and all participants have a chance to contribute, uh, the every participant has something valuable um, to add, uh, and um, you know, it can be just one or two comments that are made um, by a participant that really steer the conversation in a different direction. Um, so no, absolutely not. Um, and the skills of, of uh, discussing ideas and problems and finding solutions are skills that we in fact all have. Uh, it's certainly not something that is uh, the preserve of the well-educated. Um, and, uh, and so I think from a democratic point of view, um, it's important that everyone is in, in, included. Um, their concerns and interests, everybody's concerns and interests are on the table. Um, but certainly a well-run deliberative process um, is going to um, gain value from every one of the voices that, that are included. Thank you, Otto Matheson. Thank you. Um, here's a question that seems, uh, that is very specific to our context in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It asks, if we were to use this model in New Zealand, how could we ensure that they would be tetiriti compliant. And um, I'll, I'll combine that with another question that I see in the box, which is how would democratic innovations in New Zealand be designed to meet obligations under tetiriti? Yeah, these are great questions, really important um, questions that, that I've been reflecting upon and discussing with, with colleagues. Um, I, I guess a few things to say here. One thing just to mention is that uh, in fact, there are plans to run a citizens assembly in Porirua, um, which is being headed up and driven by Mana Whenua. Uh, and I'm gonna be um, uh, watching that uh, event with fascination uh, to, see, to see how, um, to see how uh, 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 this idea, which, which really has come from overseas is taken up in our local context in a way which is really authentic and draws upon the really deep traditions of deliberative decision-making in Te Ao Māori. So that's just one thing to mention. Um, I think um, another thing which I, I would say is that satirity was an agreement between uh, the British Crown and uh, the uh, Tangata Whenua, the tribes of New Zealand, Hapu in particular, specifically. Uh, and uh, in in the treaty, as, as it's interpreted by the Waitangi Tribunal, and which is the, um, the, the accepted legal interpretation uh, here today, the, um, the intention of te tiriti um, in, in the Maori language version, which is the, the authoritative version, uh, was not to include Maori under the um, political institutions of the British Crown, but to preserve the political institutions and legal traditions of um, Te Ao Māori. And so um, when we're thinking about uh, what would it look like to do um, a citizens assembly in uh, Aotearoa in a way that honours treaty obligations, we need to remember that in fact, um, democracy in New Zealand may well require a much more um, high level rethinking of what democracy should look like, given that 
we have a relationship between tangata whenua and tangata tirihi um, to, um, to maintain and put different political institutions potentially that will make up part of that arrangement. Um, and so uh, that was kind of a long-winded answer, but uh, it's just a signal that um, the, there, are, there are higher level kind of constitutional questions that, that come into play here. Um, and I think answering those questions will require democratic innovations. Um, the, the political system of Aotearoa in the future will have to look um, the way that it does because of the relationships and the history of this place. Uh, the kinds of democratic innovations that I've been talking about, the sortition based um, innovations may well have some role to play in that, but um, whether they do or not is, um, is not a question for me to answer. That's something that needs to be worked out in dialogue in this country. Uh, I have many more thoughts on this, but uh, perhaps I'll stop there. Uh, kia ora, Matheson, and thanks for putting it, uh, your talk in this broader context, which is really exciting to know. Um, and here's a question that um, extends this uh, topic of conversation. The question reads, do you believe that co-governance arrangements promoted at this time can be a democratic arrangement? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. It's a really important question. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, for me, one of, the, one of the important lessons that I've learned in thinking about democracy and democratic innovations over the last couple of years is that um, I, real, I came to realize that I had been taught a very narrow way of thinking about what democracy is. Democracy is periodic elections, um, it is um, party competition uh, and, um, and citizenship means voting in those elections. Uh, and I think that, that the substance of democracy is actually none of those things. The substance of democracy is a political association among human beings in some place where there is a share in political power, where there is a, um, a chance to have a say where there's a, a kind of um, empowerment to be active in the decision-making that affects your own lives. Uh, and so what that means for me is that we still have to work out what a truly democratic society looks like. From the perspective of um, Tatariti and from, um, from uh, Tangata Whenua, I think that it's very difficult to say that um, there is a kind of equal citizenship. There is a participation in the political life of society as equals. Uh, and it could be that to achieve that kind of democratic society in the, in the deepest sense of the word, um, more kind of articulated political institutions will be required. Um, Co-governance is a term that I think is used loosely. Um, I think constitutional transformation is um, the broader term that I'd want to use. Um, but is it democratic? If it, if it empowers um, individuals and communities to make the decisions, to be involved in the decisions that affect their lives, yes, it is. Thank you for that, Matheson. I want to combine now um, a couple of questions that, um, ask it, that are asking after the nuts and bolts of what you're off offering insofar as sortition goes. So um, were the participants paid uh, in the Irish government example? And um, the concern here is, if not, isn't there an inherent bias to moneyed classes? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, yeah, I think the, the consensus that's emerging among practitioners is that participants have to be paid for their work. Um, there are a number of kind of practical uh, uh, features that need to be in place in order to overcome those kinds of inequities that you were alluding to. Um, so payment for participation is one. Um, making sure that there are um, facilities like childcare and so forth is another. Um, uh, I, I think that on one hand, the, the uh, sortition idea is one that is, is attempting to, 
include voices within political decision making um, that are not usually included. Um, and so I think uh, the, the process of sortition can be really, really effective in that regard. But um, there, there are still kind of practical questions that need to be resolved. But certainly, yes, payment, I think, is, is, is mandatory um, for participating in these kinds of processes. Uh, think about it like jury duty. At the moment, unfortunately, jury duty in, in New Zealand is not, is not remunerated. Uh, there's, there's travel subsidies, I believe, um, but even those are kind of minimal. Um, so those kinds of practical considerations will have a real impact upon who's able to participate and who's not. Just one final thing to say on that. Um, the way that the sortition um, mechanism works, typically when you send out invitations inviting people to participate, you will get fewer responses from people who are from lower socioeconomic groups. Um, but, but in selecting the final participants, you can correct for that to make sure that you have the um, you, you have a good representation from all socioeconomic groups. So you might have fewer responses from that group, but you can make sure that they that uh, the people who are in the final um, assembly or jury um, do represent the, the demographic spread. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it just goes to show how engaging these conversations are when we're reflecting on these questions because the questions are so rich and are bringing out such interesting um, uh, challenges. One uh, question that's here asks after accountability. It reads, one of the principles of a well-functioning democracy is accountability. Now, is there an issue that while many publics don't need to worry about re-election, they also are unaccountable to the rest of the public? Yeah, I think accountability is a really important question um, to consider here. Uh, I'll just add a couple of things on this. I think that um, on one hand, uh, I don't think it's true that elections function as an accountability mechanism in the way that we think they do. Um, there's, there's good empirical uh, evidence on this from political scientists who look into it. Uh, it turns out that when you, when you look at how people vote, um, there's, there's very little connection actually in, in uh, voting behavior and accountability for the decisions of government. So the idea that elect, you know, we can vote the bastards out through elections sounds good, but in fact, that's not how we vote. Um, so elections aren't a very effective mechanism for political accountability, it turns out. So that's on one hand. When it comes to the citizens' assemblies, yeah, it's true that we can't um, vote citizens out of assemblies. I guess I would just observe that in interviews with participants, uh, the participants themselves experience very high levels of accountability. Um, they feel accountable to their communities to get decisions right. Uh, they feel a, a weight of responsibility. Um, I, I listened to a podcast actually, which had an interview with one of the participants from the Irish abortion law reform constitutional uh, citizens assembly. And she spoke very movingly about um, how all of them in that assembly had felt a real sense of responsibility to, to wrestle with issues deeply and to come to a set of recommendations that they thought were, were really well considered. Um, and and that, that is the, the, the tone of the participants in these processes. So I think from, from my perspective, having kind of thought about the accountability issue, I, I, I sense that, um, the sense that I have is that Citizens who are invited to participate experience a higher level of responsibility. Um, and, and so we can, we can uh, I think, feel confident that um, the accountability is there. That sense of accountability and the um, clearing that bar of accountability is, is, is there more often than not. Yeah, when you're speaking about um the imaginations of elections as characterizing democracy and your reflections on this, you know, they're really challenging us to extend our idea of what democracy is in order to consider some of these questions. So yeah, really grateful for that. One question here is the great majority of many publics according to the OECD are at local or regional level, and yet the opportunities seem to be more at central government level. So do you see the greatest opportunity at local or central government? 
Mm, yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Um, I do think that there's a scope for, for these kinds of um, mechanisms at all levels of government, actually. Um, I th they, they can work very well at local level, and that is the place where they've been mostly used um, around the globe um, to this point. There have been some national level ones. Um, that they become very fascinating. I mean, I think the, the I mentioned briefly the um, climate convention um, in, in France, which was uh, two years ago now, uh, three years ago. Um, when a citizens assembly operates at that kind of national level and it makes recommendations for what the French government ought to do in um, responding to climate change, it becomes political. And um, there was some really fascinating kind of conflict that emerged out of that. Um, uh, the, uh, Emmanuel Macron had um, promised that the recommendations of the citizens convention would be adopted. Uh, push, when push came to shove, they weren't. Um, few, a few of them were, but not many of them. Uh, and the citizens actually fought back. The, some of the participants in the citizens' assembly, you know, got into the media and said, "Look, this is not what we were promised. This is this is a kind of whitewash." Um, so when when the stakes are high, actually, um, it's not as though these citizens' assemblies are a kind of panacea they, that they can bypass politics as usual. Um, and so I, do, I certainly don't want to present them as such. Um, but I do think that there are there are issues at a national level in our own country where it looks like um, political parties across the spectrum um, are, are flailing or are wary about um, tackling big issues. And I think in those kinds of cases, it could be that citizen assemblies um, are a useful tool. Right, thank you. Um, uh, I want to return to a nuts and bolts question. There are so many of them here because it seems to have piqued the curiosity of about how actually we might employ sortition. So there must be, the question reads, there must be an onboarding process to initiate the randomly selected groups for them to be effective. Could you throw some light on some of the key features of this onboarding process? Mm. Uh, yes, so uh, the onboarding process, uh, I like that phrase, um, it tends to be quite short, but the, the first phase of these assemblies is typically a learning phase. Um, so to go back to the example of the, um, the Irish abortion law reform assembly, um, the, the assembly really was taken up in the first few sessions just learning about the issue. Uh, so they heard from legal scholars explaining why a constitutional amendment would be required to change the abortion laws in Ireland. Um, a series of experts were made available to, that they could talk to to learn about the issue. Um, I guess one of the one of the worries that critics have about many publics is that there does have to be an informational component and uh, a learning component to these processes. And who controls that learning process? Who gets to set the readings? Who chooses the experts who are interviewed? Um, the the, the people who have that role actually have a huge amount of leverage over the results of these processes. Um, and, and again, this is a learning process in the, the international community of practitioners who are involved in facilitating um, many publics. Um, there's, I think, an emerging consensus that the solution, the right solution to this problem is to actually give more autonomy to the citizens themselves. So to provide um, and not just say here is the expert that you're going to hear from, but to say here here's a list of experts. If you want to add other experts to this list, go ahead, um, and then you can decide who you want to hear from. Uh, so there are procedural things that can be done to ensure that uh, the participants have autonomy um, and are able to access the resources that they want to access to 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 deepen their knowledge of the issues. Thank you, Matheson. I want to pose um, one last question before we move to closing this fascinating discussion. It's been um, so interesting. Um, there are a few questions. Um, actually, there are many questions, but there are a few here that I want to ask in a way that rounds them all up together. And uh, they, they center on this interplay between uh, minority groups and majority groups. So on the one hand, there seems to be a concern in which how do we know that deliberation does not reinforce the prejudices of the majority? 
including how deliberations and discussions and disagreements occur. And then on the other hand, there seems to be a concern that how might um, the power of minority um, movements, the sort of um, resistance movements that threaten the stability of democracy before they can even start, how do we get past this slope? So it seems to me from the perspective of the majority, how do we protect democracy against and then from the perspective of the minority, it seems, how does the deliberation or sortition not enforce the prejudices of majority? So how do you understand this interplay? Mm, that's, a big, that's a big question uh, and a really important one. I think that, uh, um, again, to go back to the local context, I think one concern that I hear my Maori colleagues voice again and again is that as um, a minority group within the democratic structure that we have, uh, they feel they're always going to be outvoted. Um, and so from a purely kind of majoritarian voting point of view, uh, to be in a minority means that you could be persistently outvoted, that your, your interests and your agenda um, uh, could turn out to um, never um, win the day, as it were. Um, and this is where I think deliberation discussion is, is crucial. Um, in deliberative forums, there can be uh, power dynamics that reinforce the kind of um, dominant culture. That, that's a real risk, and there's some good research on that. It does occur. Um, but on the other hand, there's an opportunity to actually present your case as a minority, you know, to actually be listened to, to say, look, um, there's no way um, that this is going to work for me and um, uh, my, my community, um, and here are the reasons why. Um, and in a face-to-face -face deliberative context, um, it is possible to, um, to sway your fellow citizens um, simply by um, being the person that you are, presenting the experience that you have. Um, and so I think the, the, um, there is power for minorities in deliberation when there's a chance to actually speak face-to-face -face with um, with other members of society who may not know about the experiences and interests and concerns and histories um, that you have. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex question. It's, there's certainly no black and white um, answer here. Deliberative forums, many publics of the kind that I've described have their own power dynamics. Uh, and so this is an ongoing kind of question, something to wrestle with. How can we make our democracies um, um, more equal, um, less susceptible to um, ideological um, sway, so that there's a kind of a considered generous um, discussion about the issues that affect us all and conclusions that we can all really feel um, uh, satisfied with uh, that are actually you know, the right solutions, the good solutions for us. Now, mihi noi ki akwe, Matheson. Thank you so much for your talk. And on behalf of the listeners and the organizers, I want to thank you for your time as well. Um, thank you for everybody who joined us today and posed such interesting and challenging questions. Um, now, this event, Raising the Bar, is one of a series. So I encourage you to check out the others uh, and join us next time on topics, you know, as various as Athletes and Dementia with Helen Murray, The Untapped Potential of DNA to Personalize Your Healthcare and Extend Your Life with Justin O'Sullivan, and many, many more. Um, now me here again to everybody who was able to spare their uh, evening and join us for this wonderful conversation. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Good night. <laughs>